All right, so uh, wanted to go a little unconventional with kind of the talk here as far as, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about new tools and, and new technologies and, and really focusing on, you know, Kubernetes and, and various things. And, and for me, it was, you know, something that I often run into is at some point I need to get a shell on a box. And, and by default, that is always that, you know, the situation is like oh, SSH, like right, like you have network connectivity, you can do this thing. Let's just let's just go ahead. And and I wanted to kind of explore like new ways to do it, and and some things that we've been thinking about. Wow, there's a reminder uh, to kind of move this forward for some people and, and and make it better in some cases. So starting out with just the the very basic of like there's my box, right? Like there's there's the there's the instance or or the server or whatever I need to connect to this thing, uh, whether that's you know. I need to troubleshoot something or I'm, I actively am, am like setting up and trying new things. At some point, like a shell is just helpful to do development. I'm not talking about necessarily like production environments, like all that kind of stuff has been vetted and this is going through this process. At some point, like you have to interact with a terminal to understand things. And so how do we do this, right? Like I have my laptop, I have this box, like I need to just get from A to B. And, and typically, you know, like, a lot of people are just gonna, well, I'm on the switch, like I'm just gonna SSH, I'm gonna do something like like there's lots of ways that you can get it like back in the day, right? Like telnet, like telnet, open this thing, I can netcat to a port, like I could do all these things to connect my system to that box with some, you know, I can reverse shell it, right? Like what, however creative I want to get. Uh, there's lots of different things I can do. But that always that problem of that firewall in the way, right? Like we're running in the cloud. Uh, default security groups and VPCs and these things get confusing and how do we actually like get from here to there and so you're gonna you know figure out okay well like then like I mean moving from on-prem to a cloud environment like that's one of the first things I, I feel like a lot of people run into right it's like well I used to be able to SSH and now like it's in a VPC but I can't do that anymore it's like well you gotta you know what are you, what are you gonna do you're gonna blow a hole in there size of a 22 and, and just that's that's how you get to that box now, right? Like you're you're from your laptop through this firewall to port 22 and that's just how everyone accesses everything. And it's it's good, right? This, this works. Um, we might have some concerns, but you can, you basically can get from A to B now with this. There's problems though, right? Like, does this have a public IP address? Is this, you know, is does this have a route to this box? Is that VPC discoverable from my network? Uh, how am I actually routing from my laptop to that thing? Like, those are just some considerations that, you know, you're gonna go back and forth on the network team and, and discuss how we're gonna do this. And there's other things from the system side, right? You now have to take on POSIX users and authorized keys and you gotta log this stuff somewhere. And there's, this, you're gonna Google search how to secure SSHD, right? This is, these are all things that we're gonna do over and over again. Like that user ad command, I've been using it for more than a decade and I do not remember the flags. It's, it's okay. Like you're gonna Google these things and it's more stuff that you're gonna set up once and you're gonna forget and you're gonna move on and, and you'll get there, you'll get to that box, but it's not going to be great. And then the second problem happens, right? Like the person you're working with, they also want a box. And so now you have laptops that need to go to all these boxes and all these firewalls have port 22, you know, holes in them. And, and how are you going to manage all this stuff? Are you giving public IPs to all your instances or like port 22 on the VPC? Like, how are you doing these things to, to actually manage this stuff? And at some point someone has the great idea, right? Well, I know we're going to set up a bastion and that bastion is going to let us get to that box and then we can get to all the other instances right it's just like we're on the local network there's no security groups there's no security is you know gone as soon as we're into the bastion host i can i can get to that thing and and we're fine and you're going to google search this again okay how do i secure a bastion host how do i limit access how am i going to find these instances when i'm on the bastion uh, and then also all those other things still exist. <laughs> You're still managing an operating system. You now are at the point of configuration management. You need a puppet server or a chef server or you're running salt or Ansible, like Ansible, right? Like let's run Ansible, we can get to port 22, right? Like what if we break port 22? Like Ansible's broken. There's, there's these things that are gonna happen that you're gonna have a lot of concerns about and it's not the easiest thing in the world and, and it used to make sense when it was on a switch 
I have my laptop, we're on-prem, there's no security, it's, it's just one VLAN, we're fine, we can talk to everything. Uh, but like, these things are different in a cloud environment, and, and this isn't necessarily the best we can do, right? Like Bastion hosts port 22. Oh, and, and also like, how are you securing that port 22? Like, you're gonna be on VPN, right? So, so let's say there's a production outage or, or something, some major push I need to do. What is, I get paged, what does that mean? I go log into, like, start up my laptop. I go log into VPN. I go wait for VPN to scan my computer for every antivirus software known to man and woman. Uh, I have to, like, log into VPN and then get to port 22 of the Bastion hosts. Great, I'm on the Bastion hosts. I gotta go discover which instance is having the problem. I gotta go to AWS console and click around and find this instance name and, and do this stuff. And then, I have to like make sure my SSH keys are valid, right? I mean, there's tools to help with some of these things, but it's not easy. It's it's not a solved problem, and I don't think we should just be fine with this as the status quo. Like I, I don't like it, and I have been on a, a personal crusade at the last couple of jobs to get rid of SSH uh, and and say you don't get SSH anymore. But that doesn't mean that we have to like throw away getting a remote shell. Some other things that you might even be considering is, you know, how do I integrate my, my instance or my POSIX user with IAM? Anyone's gone down that route, it's not fun. Uh, <laughs> at some point you're gonna say, okay, well SSH, I can SSH to this host based on this tag on the instance from this authorized keys. And you're gonna do something along the lines of, you know, either integrating that with a config management tool, you're gonna have some provisioning tool, a giant user data that does it. There's lots of things you're gonna do that are not gonna be fun. You're gonna figure it out. You're gonna feel great about it. It's gonna work. It's kind of complex and we wanna build simple systems. And, and so the simple ones are the most reliable. Once you have, you know, these set of users and IAM permissions can log into these systems, you need to Google search sudo privileges, right? Like, how do I do this include with sudo? Uh, somewhere in there, you're not gonna know, like, what's the no password? Uh, what, what's the, how do I lock down like this set of commands for just, you know, infosec or finance or someone else that needs to get on this box, uh, but I don't want them to rm-rf because that's scary. Um, and then we also talked about like, you're on the bastion, I gotta discover these systems. I have to know like, this is a, an environment that that changes frequently. Uh, so I can't just say, oh, well, you know, box one, two, three is always there. It's like, no, auto scaling groups and short lived instances, like these things are all important for security and for just general upkeep that you need some sort of discovery system to do that. So you're running console or, or scraping the Amazon API, something on those lines. And then hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but you know, sometimes like people leave jobs <laughs> or a key leaks onto GitHub. And at some point you say, oh, that private key got committed publicly. Like is VPN your only source of security at that point? Like I hope not. Um, you don't want that out there. So you need to then figure out, you know, like configuration management is great at adding a lot of things. Sometimes it's not great at removing a bunch of things. So if I have keys I need to remove, how are you going to do that? How are you also going to kick sessions? Right? Like someone logged in, you know, key got leaked. Someone from some country logs into your box. You don't know if they're on there or not. You don't know, how, like you can pull the key off. They can keep a persistent session forever. Like you don't, SSH doesn't re-auth. Like they have a shell. Good luck. And so be careful with those things. Like, like again, SSH wasn't necessarily designed for some of these things. And have you ever had like, someone do something bad on a shared host, right? Like someone pull down, you know, a hundred gig database dump or, or run, you know, uh, like a load testing tool from a bastion or, you know, stress test the wrong machine and, and 10 other people are logged into that system and all of a sudden either the disk is full or someone ran, you know, shut down. <laughs> um, these things happen too, right? Like not everyone understands how bastions work and shared environments and, and why it's important to, to do things a certain ways. So these are all very legitimate concerns that we all, we should be thinking about people need access to systems, but there's probably better ways. A couple options out there. Uh, Netflix has a great tool called Bless, which is, which is for short lived access, SSH access. So it gives you a short lived certificate uh, that SSH can then log into something. You have a window of time that you can define to say, I can only, this cert is valid for five minutes. Uh, so I can access the system in five minutes, but if the cert leaks, 
and no one gets on within five minutes, it doesn't actually matter. There is still doesn't kick off a session if someone was on it and, and then you say, oh, that cert is now invalid or, or compromised or whatever, I need to get rid of it. Uh, so it's, it, it's still very reliant on SSH. Uh, Gravitational the startup has a, a product called Teleport, which is super slick, has web UI, uh, can do a lot of things. It, it still layers on top of uh, SSH in a lot of ways. It has short-lived keys, uh, but it also has um, some other features like session recording for security auditing and, and being, being able to see who sessions are, are actively running. Uh, it's, it's a really slick thing to run. Uh, it works in any cloud environment, it works on-prem, um, but it's, it, it's kind of a lot of infrastructure to run sometimes, depending on how, you know, how much security you need for these sort of environments. And then there's rolling your own, right? I mean, people do it. You can, you can add your own layer of, of complexity or security or whatever you want to call it on top of SSH to say, okay, but like, what if you only allow people to like net cat to boxes? Like, could you control that cat? Like, maybe, like, I wouldn't say no one's done it, <laughs> uh, but it's maybe not the right solution, right? Because security through shared usage of tools is, is really nice. And SSH is a very vetted tool. Uh, the you know, certificates are, are, are very well vetted, um, but there's other things that also can be used to layer on and, and kind of create these secure tunnels. Uh, so AWS has a tool called Systems Manager, which is a giant umbrella of a lot of things that can do a, a lot of different stuff. Uh, the one we actually care about is uh, Session Manager, which is uh, basically a, a way to access an instance over a WebSocket. And so instead of doing SSH tunneling on port 22, you are opening up a WebSocket to an instance and, and you can tunnel your traffic over that. You can tunnel directly a shell over that or you can tunnel uh, other things over that WebSocket tunnel. And just like, I mean, we know how web, WebSockets work. We know how to secure them. You know, TLS works. Uh, and surprisingly, like some of these other things are, are secure uh, and, and you get some other benefits out of it too. So just back to my, here's my box, here's my computer and there's that you know, nasty firewall in between. Uh, one thing that cloud environments have uh, that is a huge benefit is, is an API, a public API that is, is very secure and very well at handling uh, multiple users at once, multiple companies, multiple, you know, uh, just users of the cloud environment. Like I, I have my keys to access it. It's very secure and very locked down. Uh, so what if we actually use that as our bridge between our instance and our, and our system? Uh, so I, I wanted to actually just show off a little bit of it. It's just a quick demo. Um, I have to stop my share and then I'll switch. If Zoom is going to let me. Nope, that's not it. There we go. A pop up blocking it. Uh, where is that? And while I get that going, there's one question that popped up here, which is Doesn't HashiCorp also provide short lived cert credentials and revoke and rotate? Yes, yes. Um, HashiCorp does have. Uh, through vaults, you can you can use that as your SSH backing um, to kind of see, you know, get your instances as well. Where is my, my shell is not showing up here. I'm going to share my whole screen. The window's not there. I should have closed more windows. Hold on a second. Because now, now Zoom is, I think it limits how many it's going to show me. Hold on a second. Now let's try. Just share the whole desktop. There we are. Okay. So go away. Uh, so this is, you know, terminal. Uh, I have, uh, hopefully, can people read the text? Try to make it as giant as possible. Yep, I can read it. Okay. So uh, AWS, had, like I said, has a session manager. It's a plugin that works with um, AWS CLI. And so, uh, if you have an instance inside of your environments, uh, you, can, you can start a session. This is basically the command AWS SSM start session with a target and you use your you know, target to kind of jump into that box. And lo and behold, if I, if I run this command, it actually opens that WebSocket and gives me a shell to the box. Um, this works with uh, 
Amazon Linux has a, a SSM agent that runs on the box. You give it uh, credit or well, I am an I am profile to run with or an I am permissions on the instance itself to be able to open these connections. And, and then this just works. Uh, one of the benefits here is I don't actually need um, a public IP. I don't need port 22 open on a security group or a firewall. Uh, this can actually work with completely separate VPCs with private link. So AWS has these internal endpoints on a VPC that's even if the instance itself, uh, you can't route any traffic to it by default through the VPC, I can still allow traffic out on those private links and, and start a session with something in a private link. And it's, it's I mean, it's just, a, it's just a session, right? It's, uh, we've all seen a, a shell, which is really uneventful. Um, but one of the cool things we can do with this, because it is just a shell and, and because we can do these sorts of things, um, Session Manager also has some other tools, which all, uh, like we can run commands on these remote boxes. Uh, but the, the agent is actually open source, so you can run it on other systems, uh, as well as systems that aren't in Amazon. <laughs> uh, they have this notion of a managed instance, and, and it's, you can actually, uh, so if I, uh, so I can, I have a, a, another, I have a managed instance here uh, called whatever, I don't remember the name of it, uh, but if I look at this in, in a different profile, um, I can run a command, I'll, I'll show you SSM run is actually a, a tool that we open source to uh, be able to do this stuff. And this is actually running on a uh, Raspberry Pi uh, in, my, in my closet, like right next to me. Um, so this is going through the Amazon API uh, and then the box actually makes an outbound connection. So there's no inbound uh, open ports on my network, but their agent keeps a long lived outbound connection to the Amazon API and listens for a message to that box. And we say, oh, like that's, we know how to do outbound traffic. Uh, we can do filtering on it, but I can then trigger that to run a command and, and, and run commands locally on, on my local instance as well. Uh, and then you can also, um, like this works anywhere, right? So if I, or another command, I had another personal box. Um, it's it's kind of hard to tell, but this is just a, a standard Debian box um, running in GCP. <laughs> so I have a, a instance in GCP that I can run commands on with Amazon CLI, uh, which is super bizarre, but also really fun. But these are kind of like uh, the the basics of of this of the uh, start session command is is really clunky. Uh, it's, it's not very intuitive. Uh, and I have to still find these targets and, and what else can I do with this? Um, but again, because this is just a WebSocket to the Amazon API, uh, we open source some tools called SSM helpers. Um, and so there's one called, we named a tool uh, SSM session, which will actually do some of this lookup for me from the Amazon API. It'll, it'll look at what instances I have registered uh, and then allow me to pick based on what I have running, uh, just an instance to start a session with. So it takes a little bit to actually do those API calls sometimes. <laughs> Come on, you got it. There it is. Uh, so these are just, you know, some instances that I, I set up that are running. Um, I can select one of them um, and then I can, I can hit enter. And again, I start a session with that instance. Um, but because again, these are just WebSocket tunnels uh, with um, with a shell basically piped over that. Uh, we can do even more. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me. Sorry, cancel that. Uh, let's. We can actually do something like uh, US S two. We can we can specify different regions. Um, and so, and, and we can also specify different profiles. Um, so I can, I can run, I can find instances in multiple regions and with multiple AWS profiles all at once. And, and so I can, I can make these calls, API calls under the covers. It's switching out my, you know, API keys as it's trying to do those requests and, and calling out to Amazon and saying, you know, I need to find instances over in West. I need to find them in East, in the EU regions, wherever you want to do it. And, and I can list out, it looks like I got pretty much Oh, there's one in West. Uh, I don't have very much in the West. Um, but I can select these instances. I can select multiple at a time. 
hit enter and actually drop into a session with all of them. Uh, why not? Like this is something we can do. Uh, the, the tool just kind of shells out to the tools, to the underlying AWS tools right now. Um, set W, synchronize panes on. But now we can also synchronize all our panes. Oh, one of my shells is hanging. Is it going? Oh, that one didn't. That one didn't like it. Let's kill this one. Uh, yes. So. So I mean, I have three different shells on on three different instances in different regions uh, and possibly different AWS accounts. So I can do various things, right? Well, I like saying, okay, I need I need this information. I need to troubleshoot boxes. I need to find the one that's having a problem. Uh, this allows us to kind of do some of that stuff in a more user-friendly way than, than limiting us to individual AWS accounts or regions at a time, which is typically how AWS tools are, are focused, is, is doing it that way. And then same thing with um, SSM run. Uh, we can select multiple profiles. Um, I can select a, um, a tag. Is it tag or filter? I actually don't remember right now. Let's look. Um, got regions, we got profiles, we have, we can set limits, uh, which if you want to specify just instances directly, you can, um, filters, it is a filter. Um, so let's say env equals dev, uh, dry run, and specify a command of uptime. And so this would, well, I, I didn't have anything with that tag. That's right, this, this demo didn't have a environment dev, but um, you can do those sorts of things to match things on tags uh, to be able to see what is actually gonna run. And you can run a, a command to get information from boxes, find out load, find if there's disks fulls, that kind of stuff. And, and this does it in a, a more, in my opinion, cloud native way, rather than trying to layer the configuration management tools to do some of the stuff. Let's use those APIs that the, the uh, cloud providers give us to, to kind of look up this stuff. It's, it's a much easier way and integrates much better with what we're already trying to do on the system level. Uh, so I think the only other thing I had here is uh, just the actual tools themselves. Um, SSM helpers were, were open sourced a couple weeks ago. Uh, um, have, you know, please pull them down there. Their, uh, we tried our best to kind of solve some of the problems that we had with uh, making, making SSH work everywhere and making other tools like Chef Knife or M Collective, uh, some of those tools a little more friendly. Like we, we try to keep similar um, workflows, but also improve it by, by leveraging, you know, labels on instances and that sort of stuff. And so that's all I actually have for the uh, presentation. Thank you, Justin. Um, so we have a question here. Um, so how does how does SSM helpers work under the covers? Uh, and also, what language is this thing written in? Yeah, they're um, they're all written in Go. The one uh, caveat is uh, the SSM session actually shells out to the AWS CLI because the uh, the protocol for the session manager uh, WebSocket isn't isn't public. And so we are asking and, and working with Amazon a couple times to um, see if they can either open source that library or open source the protocol uh, so that we can build it directly into the tools themselves so we don't require shelling out. Uh, but for now, it, it, SSM session will shell out to the underlying AWS CLI. Uh, SSM run is completely standalone binary, uh, which just use the API and the public uh, Go CDK from Amazon. Cool. I have another question here. <laughs> so I'm sure any of our listeners who are in the position where they're trying to determine how best to do these secure SSH <laughs> type, uh, how to handle these secure SSH type problems. And you mentioned a bunch of different ways that people have addressed it in the past, as well as using these SSM uh, helper tools. And I was wondering what should anyone listening go learn after this? What would you recommend as tools in this space that people should go seek out after this? I mean, a lot of it depends on 
where they run, right? If someone has infrastructure at different places, uh, GCP has really fantastic web-based SSH and, and web-based console. Uh, you can actually run the SSM session from a, a Google Cloud shell to go manage your AWS instances. Um, I've done that from Chromebooks before. It's super handy. Uh, <laughs> so you can, you can do that stuff. It depends on where you run. If you're running on-prem, uh, one of the things with uh, Session Manager is it does require like a different tier of support from Amazon. So if you want to start sessions with on-prem, you need to pay them a little more. Uh, but I would, I would really depend on, I think, where the person, where the infrastructure runs and, and kind of what the security profiles are for the people running them. What's your policy around how I get access to a system? Uh, there's a lot of really cool networking things coming out. Uh, things like tail scale and zero tier networking, which are overlays that kind of let you like use, it's like a VPN, but like a hipster VPN, um, where it's just an overlay network that we applied, you know, from Kubernetes world. And, and it's just, it's networking. It's networking on top of networking, but we can make these overlay networks that let us access things in, in very secure ways and, and access them uh, without needing to know like the Cisco CLI. And so really I always encourage people, you know, find out for your, in your environments with your team and, and with your security policies, what can be allowed and really look at some of these newer tools because instead of building everything yourself on top of SSH and just saying SSH is the way to go, uh, things like Session Manager and Teleport, uh, they, they give you enhancements to know which sessions are currently going on in all of your infrastructure. I can audit those things. I can look at uh, recordings of, uh, I can actually record and, and store sessions that are run. So I can see every command that someone runs, who it was, when it was, and those sorts of things are really handy that again, you can build it yourself with SSH and give them a, you know, wrapper around bash or something. But in a lot of cases, those get really fragile, they get complex. The person who set them up left the company years ago and no one knows how it works. Uh, so really try to lean on a, a company and if you can, a cloud provider directly, if that's where your infrastructure runs, uh, to understand how the tools work and, and what you can do beyond just I need a command prompt on a box. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into that than just the command prompt. There's all the infrastructure, what you have to manage, how you provision it, how you you know understand who's there, what they can do. Uh, those things are really difficult. Awesome, thank you. So lean, lean on a company that specializes in this stuff and a cloud provider if you can, because it's pretty complex stuff, right? So I got a curious question on, so I saw inlets this morning and I'm curious, how do you, first, are you familiar with the inlets project? Yeah. Uh, how does this yeah. fit in with that? Uh, inlets lets you, it, it's, it's a similar solution where internal system makes an outgoing connection, mm -hmm. a persistent outgoing connection somewhere that other system then lets people route into it, right? Like it's an outgoing connection that I can route traffic down, down into. Uh, this is a very similar situation where I can do it specifically for shells. Uh, you can also, Session Manager can work with um, proxy commands, so I can, I can proxy a port. Um, it also has a proxy command for, like you can tunnel SSH over a Session Manager session. So I don't need port 22 open, I don't need VPN, I don't need these things, I can actually SSH I dash whatever my instance name is, and the proxy command will open up a WebSocket tunnel to the Amazon API, tell that system to also open a WebSocket tunnel, and you can then SCP over it, you can port forward, you can SSH. Those sorts of things work too. So this is a WebSocket tunnel to the Amazon API. Inlets lets you kind of control where that API or where that termination endpoint is in the cloud, where I say, I at some point you're gonna run a box in a cloud provider or something that has public access. And so you are the one that secures the, the public box that other things route to, and then it controls where that stuff goes internally that doesn't typically have a route. So in this case, we're relying on Amazon to be that termination endpoints that I don't have to, you know, I don't have to stand up the infrastructure or pay for the infrastructure. I pay, uh, well, session manager is free <laughs> uh, and, and uh, system manager is free. So it, wherever my infrastructure is, um, I can I can probably access that. And I'm paying for the infrastructure, not the overhead for some of that stuff. Inlets is I think solves a great problem of I want you know someone to publicly to hit the web port of the thing I'm developing locally, uh, which I, I think is still a need. Uh, you I don't know if you could actually do it with Session Manager because nothing is public by default on the other end. It's just bridging the gap between Amazon controlled infrastructure or managed instances in Amazon back to myself to to my local machine. 
so you'd see you can kind of see uh kind of to Kazan's point like that this is inlets this and a bunch of different tools all together that you're using so you can kind of see people using this alongside inlets and other things yeah i don't know if i assume inlets would also let me tunnel ssh out to you know a, a instance in the in the public domain like i have an instance out there i you know tunnel port 22 and that connects ssh internally again but the problem is like i have to manage authorized keys users yeah. uh, all these things are still something i have to manage on the infrastructure locally uh, session manager uh, the the agent itself comes with amazon linux it's running automatically and and it is provisioned and and you have access through im credentials so i'm going to have to manage im credentials no matter what in an amazon environment so it lets me forget about a lot of the customizations on the box. Uh, Inlets is very much a flexible uh, open, you know, I can open any port I want, which opens a web socket to a box, it doesn't matter what it is. And it's, it's very flexible, but there is some ownership around the infrastructure you're running on both sides. Um, so I, uh, one another question I have is, uh, where do you see the project going in the next six months? Like, where do you want to take this, this open source project, you know, um, trying to get people to contribute to it. You know, are you open to having more contributors? Uh, who else is contributing? Um, so what's the future? Yeah, for sure. Uh, right now we're, we're really focusing on the use case of managing instances and managing infrastructure in a, a multi-region, multi-account sort of environment. That's where we saw a lot of gaps in, in what we wanted to do and, and really make sure that the workflows to manage that sort of infrastructure is, is easier uh, and, and also replacing things like SSH and uh, M Collective or Chef Knife uh, in our environments. We would love contributions from people. There's a lot of other features of Systems Manager that we think could be helpful. And there's other things we would like to build in just to kind of make the workflow better. Like I said, um, port forwarding is a thing that exists already. Um, it would be great to also support um, things like uh, SCP over the session manager sockets. Uh, we also have thoughts of doing things um, for getting a session to a container that's not necessarily in Kubernetes, right? Like I have kube control execs that will get me that shell, but I might have shells other, or I might have containers other places. I might have, you know, Fargate or I might have uh, ECS or something like that. And, and this, it's possible that this sort of a, a general purpose WebSocket with um, SSM documents or systems manager documents can allow you to do much more flexible things inside, specifically inside of Amazon. But absolutely, if people have ideas, uh, you know, we're open. We have, it, like I said, only open source and it was kind of officially announced last week. Uh, so no one else is really contributing to it yet. It was just kind of our use cases and we really wanted to kind of put this out into the community and see what other people were trying to do and, and where they saw gaps with either managing a lot of infrastructure for secure tunnels or, or managing things in multiple regions, multiple accounts. Very cool, yeah, I like it, it's awesome. Thanks. And there's one other thing that I wanted to touch on since we have a few minutes here before our next talk. Uh, a lot of people are, pretty much everyone is stuck at home right now. And a lot of people are using this as an opportunity to learn some new things. I wanted to talk a little bit about the book that you wrote with Chris Nova about cloud native infrastructure. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that book covers and what people might want to learn from it while they're stuck at home? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is, I don't want to say it's it, it's a couple years old now, but we really tried to focus on the principles of running infrastructure in a cloud environment. It was, I, I think we mentioned Kubernetes in the book twice. Uh, we tried to keep any product specific things out of, of the book and, and really focused on, on, in my opinion, two things. One was how your company and policies and, and processes should change in a cloud environment and in an environment that it's self-service, it's, uh, infinitely scalable, scalable uh, or, or it's, it's just, it's easy for developers to access resources that they maybe didn't have before. And even if some of those resources are, you know, off the shelf, uh, Elasticsearch or Redis or, or those sorts of products that typically was, let me order a, a system and or set up a VM myself and then install this stuff and then configuration management, all that. What does it look like when those services exist, when developers have access to them? And the infrastructure is is a pay as you go model where it's not a you know upfront cost to buy servers and rack them and everything else. Uh, so really, 
I'd say a good portion of the book was, was about the process and about people and how that changes and how companies have been successful with that, how you know, Microsoft and Google and Netflix and Amazon and, and these companies have been doing cloud, either building the clouds or using the clouds for a very long time. We tried to go a lot of that learning out of it. Uh, the second big portion of the book is really about how to run your infrastructure the way those, the people that are successful run infrastructure. And a lot of it comes down to things we learned and, and made available inside of Kubernetes, where it was all about control loops and it was about running infrastructure as software, not as code. And so code is a repository for, full of YAML files or, or Terraform modules and things that you run once a week, once a month. You don't know if the drift is there. You don't know if this is going to break next time you run it. And really making, turning your infrastructure management into running code that constantly does reconcile loops and constantly takes the state of the desired state of the world and the current state of the world and merges those together, which is really what Kubernetes does, right? Like control loops and operators. And these things will take a spec from someone that says, I, here's your data, here's what the world looks like. How do I make that reality? And you can do that with anything, right? This isn't just something we can do with Kubernetes. This is something we can actually do with VMs or instances. And, and uh, I like to go back to like the Netflix um, chaos monkeys are essentially this chaos monkeys is like a reverse of like building infrastructure is, is soft, like actually running infrastructure is software, but it tears it down and it, it constantly like, Oh, here's an instance that I'm going to tear down and, and then see what breaks and it monitors those things and it can put it back and it gives you alerting on it. And it's not a one time, like someone didn't run a bash script and that's chaos monkey. Uh, there's actually software and there's things that are running that are doing that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's, really like kind of the point I think of the book, like the main thing if people can learn anything is, is having, you know, configuration management was a great evolution period is necessary in a lot of ways, but it's not infrastructure as software. You need software that runs that manages your infrastructure. Uh, that's more than just a, you know, a git push run this scripts. It's, it needs to constantly run so that you know for sure the state of the world or you get alerted or reconciled in some way to make that the current state. Otherwise things drifts, things break and you don't know about it. And, and it gets hard when those feedback loops are really wide between when I run something and when I commit to Terraform and then I apply the thing. You just need it running all the time. Awesome. I really like the statement, run, a, run your infrastructure as software, not just as code. <laughs> I think that's an interesting delineation. So it sounds like uh, if people are interested in learning about how running cloud native infrastructure changes the way that your business runs, the book's got that. It's got information about the tools that are used to run cloud native infrastructure. So it's got a lot of good stuff in there. CNIbook.info is the site, the landing page that we threw up a while ago for uh, if people are interested. It just has links out to it. I don't know if there's any free versions of it right now, but often sometimes it gets sponsored and so there's free downloads and PDFs if it's up there. <laughs>